지금부터는 이번 올해 어, 주제 메인이라고 할수 있는 넥스트 미래 다음을 주제로 제너레이션 독자 그리고 테크놀로지 기술 그리고 마지막으로 어, 스트레티지 전략 이세 세션들을 이제 차례대로 이어가는 순서인데요. 첫 번째로 넥스트 제너레이션 독자 순서입니다. 어, 이 세션에서는 밀레니얼 세대의 뉴스 소비 방식을 알아보고요. 또 그들을 위한 뉴스 형식을 논의하기 위해서 마련됐는데요. 첫 세션은 미국에서 오신 스테파니 에저리 교수님의 발표로 시작을 하도록 하겠습니다. 연사에 대해서 설명을 간략하게 드리겠습니다. 미국 노스웨스턴대 메딜 저널리즘 스쿨의 부교수로 계시는 분이고요. 주로 뉴미디어가 사람들의 뉴스 소비 그리고 정치 참여 방식을 어떻게 바꾸는지에 대해서 연구를 해오고 계십니다. 또 미국 국무부 산하 국제정보 프로그램에서 저널리즘 분야의 연사로도 활동하고 계신데요. 네, 스테파니 에저리 교수님께서는 새로운 세대, 새로운 선택, 청년과 뉴스의 관계를 주제로 발표해 주시겠습니다. Hello, um, good afternoon. Thank you uh, to KPF for inviting me here to talk with you. I'm really excited to be sharing with you some of my research about young people, particularly in the U.S. context, and what that means for the future of journalism in the U.S. and perhaps elsewhere. Uh, to begin my talk, I would like to outline a couple shifts in the new media environment. I think key to understanding young people and their media choices is understanding how the media environment at large has changed. And first, it looks a little different than it did in the past. There are more ways of consuming news. Print newspapers, television, radio, which were the dominant way of encountering, encountering and consuming news, now exist alongside digital media accessed through a computer, social media that you can find on a mobile device. Uh, this data from Pew, based on US audiences, shows you that television is still a popular way that people most often get their news, but also on the rise are things like news websites and social media, which we see are trending upward. And then that very low blue line would be people who often consume print newspapers. Second, there are a lot more ways of consuming news. There are also a lot more sources that are providing news content. Uh, we have sources that provide commentary, opinions, in the US politically oriented media that come from liberal media as well as conservative media. We have journalism sources that specialize in a particular type of journalism, uh, maybe investigative journalism outlets or explainer journalism. There are also sources that mix news and entertainment, so you're able to laugh or consume information about the day's events, as well as be entertained. And of course, this is just a small sample. There are many, many other ways to consume news uh, and sources to consume that news from. So the question is not only do people consume news, but what type of news are you consuming? Not all of these sources are going to appeal to everybody. And instead, we're seeing that different people are gravitating towards different types of sources. And third, the media environment today is one of high choice. More media means more news, yay, but it also means more entertainment. If you do not want to consume news, it is arguably more easier than it's ever been for you to avoid it altogether. A media scholar, Kim Schroeder, talks about this in terms of the supermarket of media, where audiences walk down the aisles perusing their options, and so some people are choosing to engage with news and a lot of news in a lot of different ways, while other people are choosing not to consume news. They're walking down a different aisle um, and not making news part of their daily lives. And so what my research looks like in my role as, as a professor at Northwestern is really looking at how these shifts in where news can be found and the types of news people are consuming. What does that mean for news exposure and news effects? In other words, in what ways does this new media environment deepen engagement and enable engagement with news and enable positive effects like participation or learning? 
And in what ways does this media environment present some real challenges to news consumption and maybe also produce some negative effects like believing misinformation or disinformation? Now, while these questions are applicable and very relevant to all people, young and old, young people have gotten a lot of attention, have been the subject of a lot of attention, um, particularly whoops, regarding their news consumption or lack thereof. This is just a sample of some recent headlines over the years. And some of this attention is very warranted. Young people, this millennial generation, now we have Generation Z, have only known a high choice media environment. They have been raised with a very different relationship to technology. Many of them have grown up with access to technology, have gone to schools with computers in the classroom, having access to tablets. A majority of them have personal access to a smartphone or a mobile device. So there is a lot that makes this generation very distinct. And so for the remainder of my talk, I want to talk about three key points that I think are important to understanding this next generation and their relationship to news. And I want to start by saying that developing the habit of news consumption begins early. It begins long before adulthood. It begins during childhood, where a type of socialization takes place. And particularly the ages of 12 to 17, the period of adolescence, are a really important time period for learning the values, attitudes, and behaviors that teenagers will carry with them into adulthood. So what does this mean for news and news consumption? It means that during those teenage years right, are when people are developing some sense of whether consuming news is something they should be doing. That's where they're developing some sense of whether news has value or not, or the types of news that they should be consuming. And so while there is a lot that is really different and really new about this media environment, there are also aspects that are more timeless. And the process of socialization, where young people learn the habit of news consumption, is one of those processes. And this was something that co-authors of I and I found when we studied a national sample of teenagers in the US, 12 to 17 year olds, and we were particularly looking at their news consumption across four different devices. We wanted to know what factors explain teenagers, 12 to 17 year olds, consuming news on television, or using a computer for news, or a tablet, or mobile phone, right? So we looked at these separately, but what we found was a really consistent set of findings. By far, the strongest predictor of youth consuming news on a specific device was a parent also consuming news on the same device. We call this matched modeling, that youth see the behaviors that their parents display, and they model those behaviors. They see them as valuable, as something that they should start to incorporate. So in other words, to give you an example, the strongest predictor of youth consuming news on a mobile device was having a parent that also consumed news on a mobile device. And that's controlling for a lot of other ways that parents could have been consuming news. It's also worth pointing out, and I always mention this in case there are any parents in the audience, that we also looked at whether uh, parental encouragement to consume news had an effect. Sadly, parents just encouraging their children to consume news did not have an effect on youth consuming news. So uh, just telling your children to consume news does not have an effect on them. You actually have to model the behavior. So parents are the strongest, but they are not the only predictor of youth consuming news. Schools also play a role, and specifically news-based classroom activities. Youths who had these experiences, who had classrooms that integrated news into activities, like learned what made good reporting, or talked about news stories in class, were more likely to consume news across all four devices. 
And also playing a role are friends. Friends matter. And teenagers who had a friend group that talked about current events outside of school were more likely to consume news, specifically on more mobile devices. So specifically for a mobile phone news consumption and tablet news consumption, talking with friends about current events did not have an effect on television, which is arguably a news consumption experience that is more within the home. So what I hope that you get from this very brief description is that these forces start early, before adulthood. And in many, many cases, efforts to increase young adults' news consumption need to start before they reach the age of 18, right? It starts with bringing news into the classroom. It starts with bringing news into friend groups. It starts with parents socializing and modeling that behavior for their children. And this was clearly something that the New York Times realized when they developed their special issue, the New York Times for Kids. Uh, they did this in 2017, it now runs monthly. And what they're doing here is developing a way for youth for ages eight to 13 year olds, so the age is a little lower, but they're developing a way for children to model their parents' newspaper reading. They're developing a way for this younger audience to learn the habit of liking the New York Times, to learn the habit of thinking that it has value, to learn the habit of making time to read a print newspaper. Right? The New York Times is using their existing audience to socialize their future audience, right? building a relationship with them early. It's very smart. So the second point I want to make, sort of uh, contradictory here, is that not all news consumers are the same, even among youth. So I was just talking to you about general trends among youth. Now I would like to make the point that we need to not think about youth as a single entity. While they do share a lot of common experiences, they are all digital natives, they all have had access increasingly to technology, there are some significant differences among youth. And not all news will appeal to youth universally. And this was something, again, that I found in one of my research studies with a group of co-authors where we identified four different types of news consumers. And how we went about this was first measuring news consumption across 27 different measures. So I'm showing you here, this is a lot is up here. But what I want you to get a sense of by showing you these measures is that this does cover a wide variety of genres. So we have local news, national news, news satire, uh, social media. We're also incorporating a lot of different devices that can be used to consume these, these types of news. So using the television, print, online, mobile devices, and then as well as a couple digital native specific sources that are mentioned at the very end. So through accounting all for all of these 27 pretty robust but not exhaustive ways of consuming news, we identified four different types of news consumers. So teenagers have four different diets that make them four different types of news consumers. And the first one that we identified were what we call traditional news viewers. And they fit about 19% of youth. And these people have a strong preference for television news, and particularly local television news, as well as in the US network television news. And this preference is so strong that even when they go online, they seek out television sources, so TV websites, TV news websites, when they are using a computer for news. The second type of news consumer we called algorithm dependent news users and they reflect about 15% of youth. Now these people similarly also have a very strong preference for a specific way of encountering and consuming news, but this time it's for news uh, across social media or consuming news through algorithms like searching using Google News or Yahoo. 
These people do not consume television. The third one, which tends to be the one that lots of people like, <laughs> are news omnivores. And these people reflect about 14% of youth. And they consume a lot of news and a wide variety of news. Similar to the first two groups, they are consuming television news. They also are encountering news on social media. And then they are also very heavy mobile phone uh, news consumers. They also are more likely to consume those digital native sources that I mentioned. So these people are really using the high choice media environment to really engage with a lot of news and a wide variety of news. It's also worth mentioning that in this study we also looked at teenagers uh, participation in their local communities as well as political activities and news omnivores are the highest. They're participating at the highest level in their community and also in political activities. Now, for people that are good at math, we're missing a portion of people, and that's the fourth type of news consumer or not news consumer. Um, we call these people news avoiders. Elsewhere, I've referred to them as the unaudience, and they reflect 52% of youth, and these people are uh, very low in all types of news measured. They're, despite there being lots of choices and lots of different types of news to engage with, these people are not making news part of their daily lives. Um, also worth noting that in terms of participating in their communities or politics, these news avoiders were the lowest. So while this typology is based on teenagers and, and not adults, um, I would argue that today's teenagers are tomorrow's adults, right? And key to understanding where we're going in the future is understanding the current relationship or not relationship in the case of news avoiders that teenagers have with news. Now, does that mean that these four groups that I've identified here won't change when it, as people age? No, I, I think there, it is likely that they do evolve and shift and develop as people do enter adulthood and age. In some of my work with the national general population in the US, I've identified somewhere between five to six different types of news consumers. So I do think there is some room for these four groups to fracture, develop, grow, particularly into more politically oriented news diets. That being said, there is a lot of similarities to what we uncovered in this study of teenagers and what I have observed in my work on adults. Similar to what we see with adults, there's a group of people that prefer more traditional legacy television oriented ways of getting news. Also, similar to adults, there's a group that prefers more new spaces and new modes of encountering news, particularly ones that rely on algorithms like Facebook's news feed or a search return. And similar to adults, there are also a group of people that are consuming a lot of news in a lot of different ways, and particularly a group that's quick to adopt new types of technology that they apply to news consumption. But what I want to flag for a little bit is this fourth group, right? I think this is really important. I think these news avoiders that reflect 52% of youth um, deserve some, some thinking about. Um, do I think that news avoiders are going to turn 18 and then all of a sudden start consuming and reading the newspaper? I do not think that's going to happen. Um, and so if this trend continues into the future, I think this is really problematic. If 52% of youth already are not making time for news, don't see its value, aren't learning that habit, perhaps they don't have parents to model that behavior, or they don't have schools to introduce news into the classroom, I think it's a significant issue that this behavior is already showing itself and it's likely to continue into the future. So with that, I would like to kind of raise a, a question in the form of my third point. 
And so this is why do some people consume little to no news? And in my experience, this can be a, a hard, a difficult question for journalists. A lot of times when I'm talking to journalists about this question and this issue, I get responses like, well, I guess young people just don't care about what's happening in the world. Or I get responses like, well, wait until they buy a house or they start having kids and then they'll start reading the newspaper. I, think, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think that's a big gamble to adopt that mindset. Um, it's worth noting in my capacity as a teacher, right, my journalism students also struggle with this question, and they're young adults, but they love news, and they're journalism students, and they clearly see its value, and they have a really hard time imagining, understanding, sympathizing with people who aren't making news part of their daily life. And this is where I think research is really essential, and it's what a lot of my most recent research have focused on, is exploring why some people, not all young adults, as I showed you, there are omnivores, there are people that are engaging with news, but why are some young adults, some teenagers, not making news part of their media decisions? So I'm going to show you a series of data. Um, the first I want to start with was some data that I collected in 2016. This is nationally represented, uh, representative survey data of young adults in the US, ages 18 to 29. And in this project, I was interested in measuring different attitudes that young adults have about the news media. So I accounted for things like thinking the news media is biased or inaccurate or thinking the news media is too negative. And I really wanted to see what relationship, if any at all, your attitudes about the news media have on your volume of news consumption. Right? So I want to highlight for you one specific attitude. We asked young adults the extent to which they agreed with this statement. News is not made for someone like me. And this was their response. So I'll kind of walk you through this. Um, if it's hard to see in the back, my apologies. About 20% are agreeing with this statement, either agree or strongly agree. And that means they're saying, yeah, news is not for me. On the opposite side, on the left-hand side of this chart, is about 30%, which is disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with the statement and saying, no, news is made for me. Right. And then that, that middle bar, which is the tallest, are people that neither agree nor disagree. They're undecided. Okay. So why am I showing you this statement? Why do I think this is an important statement? It's because it's highly predictive of your overall news consumption. So, Young adults who are more likely to agree with this statement and say news is not made for someone like me have lower levels of news consumption. Conversely, if you're disagreeing with that statement, right, you're saying, oh, I think news is for me, you're more likely to consume higher levels of news. I think in this statement, it reflects a kind of disconnect, a sense that you don't need to consume news because it's not for you. So when I look at this just simple descriptive data, what I see is the big question of how can we move people towards the left side of this chart? How can we get more people to not agree with this statement and disagree with this statement? And I think there's a lot of opportunity, probably the best opportunity, for those of you that have experiences in changing attitudes and persuasion, I think the best case is with that middle group. People who are undecided, who neither agree nor disagree, they're on the fence. And I think it becomes critical that these 50% that are in the middle do not move towards the right side of the chart, do not all of a sudden start agreeing Now I asked this question again in a follow-up survey, this time with 
uh, a general population this past year. And again, the same relationship holds. If you agree with this statement, you're consuming lower levels of news. If you disagree with this statement, you're consuming higher levels. But what I want to show you are group differences. So the blue line indicates disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with this statement, and the red line indicates agreement across four different age groups. Okay. So you see that about 15% of young people are agreeing with the statement, 22% are disagreeing, but what I want you to see from this is the gap between agreeing and disagreeing and how that widens. Right? The gap between agreeing and disagreeing for that young 18 to 29 year old cohort is seven points. Right? To take it to the extreme end of the oldest age group, 75, 65 and above, that gap is like 45 points. Right? They're much more likely to disagree with the statement. Very little, low levels of them, 4% uh, of them are agreeing with the statement. It's very clear to older people that news is for them. And in my opinion, I think they're, they're largely right. So what I would like to do um, with the remainder of my time is to shed some light on why I think young people might think that news is not for them. I would like to suggest that it has something to do with perceived value or lack thereof, or not seen how news fits your life. And I'd like to give you two data examples, brief descriptive examples of um, particular attitudes that I think are really poignant among young people. And the first is the statement, issues I care about are covered in the news. And here again, you see the same format, except now the green line is agreeing with that statement, saying yes, the issues I care about are in the news, and the orange line are disagreeing with that statement. Again, you're seeing more people agree with the statement than disagree, so that's good. Right? But I hope what you're also seeing is this continued gap between young people being not as sure, right? Be more likely to disagree. And that is actually what I found when running a little bit more sophisticated of a model, even controlling with other socio-demographic factors like sex, race, education, political ideology. Age, being younger, predicts your disagreement, predicts you saying, mm, I'm less likely, I don't really think the news is showing me things that I care about. And the same thing is true for the statement, the news media cover topics that impact my life. This isn't quite as severe, but again, you see that young people are more likely to disagree with this statement than old people, even when controlling for other demographic factors. Okay. I do want to make the point that just because young people believe that this is true, doesn't mean it's actually true. Right? There are many examples of outlets that are doing really high quality, innovative, amazing work targeting and reaching out and engaging young people. But what I do think these attitudes I've shown you today symbolize are the very real perceptual barriers that some young people have regarding news journalism. And the challenge, as I see it, is how do we change those attitudes? The challenge is how do you understand the issues that young people care about? The challenge is learning how to tell important stories, leading with your new judgment, right? but telling important stories in a way that young people understand how it does impact their lives. And so I want to end now by coming back to something that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, which was the challenges and opportunities of this high choice media environment. And I think there are great opportunities uh, to deepen news engagement by creating new spaces, new products, new modes of storytelling that will appeal to news consumers and engage them in an even deeper level. 
But at the same time, there are also some really significant challenges that come with this media environment. Challenges that some young adults face in not developing the habit of news consumption, of not seeing its value in their daily life, or having strategies that enable their very easy avoidance of news altogether. Right? And so I sort of see these parallel tracks um, that become very important for the future of news. Um, figuring out and doing the hard work of innovating in order to deepen people's engagement, but also doing the hard work and innovating to try to grow engagement from the bottom up. And I don't think that either one of those are very easy, but I, I don't want to pretend that converting news avoiders into more regular consumers of news will be easy. But it is something that I think is um, really important to securing the future audience of news and also the, uh, a more robust and participatory society. So thank you.